So shall we get into this this Q and A then? I think. Rick yeah, I'm down. I'm super down. Yeah, awesome. All right. I think uh, we're prepared. A little bunch of questions that everyone's asked. Okay, so sweet. Rick, ladies and gentlemen, wanna, you... this is the Q and A with Don McLennan, Neighborhood Radio. Yee. All these questions are going to be submitted from users within the community. We sent on a Google uh, Docs form just for everyone to submit their questions uh, pertaining to the upcoming project, Changing of the Trees. So I have a soundboard on me, so I got to just make the sounds myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they need to add soundboard to stages. It would make life so much easier. <laughs> that would be fucking crazy. That would be so fire. All right, so we're just going to go down this list. Uh, Zeke, yeah. I don't know if you want to just go back and forth between asking the yeah, going, I, I think, questions. I, th All right. I, think, I think that works, yeah. All right, so this first one says, it's easy to view the title Changing of the Trees as a direct reference to changing of seasons, like the seasonal beauty of those changing trees. Would you consider this album a reflection of the metaphorical changing of seasons in your life? absolutely yeah um i think that that's kind of like definitely like the most direct one that's there you know what i'm saying we um we came up with the title actually while i was um driving with someone on my team um xavier we were like just like it was like sometime in the fall and we were just kind of talking about like what our plans were for the next season and that phrase was like just like brought up in the conversation i was like yo this is it's a pretty brilliant like set of words right there I, I like how that feels and like the way that that mm. that what, what that describes like emotively and um i just felt like it like symbolized a lot of stuff that was going on in my life like very much so literally but also um just metaphorically you know what i'm saying so i just uh i, I thought that it was like a really good title to like to to a set of like to basically like a collection of songs that i wanted to used to set the tone for what like the future of like me being a solo musician is going to look like so do you see this as more of like a foundational step in your career absolutely you know um i'm not necessarily like trying to have this be like the magnum opus or anything like that i just want to make sure that um i'm doing like the due process of putting yep. music out as an individual mm -hmm. correctly and also um, trying to, like, create, like, I don't know, like, trying to create, like, a, an environment for, like, all of the talented musicians that I've known and met in my life to be able to be involved in the music that I create. You know what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. And just outside of it just being, like, an insular process of, like, it being, like, one specific group or anything like that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so the next question was, um, whether or not there'll be any features on the project. So, um, there are a couple, but it's not necessarily like the features that y'all would expect. There's like a couple of like, there's a couple vocal features, but most of the features on the record are from musicians that like okay. I know and like respect in my community and stuff like that. And people that I've been, um, just doing like sessions with, I'm, I, I don't know. I've been, um, I, I spent a lot of time listening to a lot of music, obviously, since I put a project out. And um, yep. I wanted to kind of let the instruments speak a little bit more and not just have them be something that I rap on top of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, even in that regard, there's like some songs where like the, the hook is like just a specific type of guitar phrase um, mm -hmm. that fits really well and there doesn't necessarily need to be a voice on top of it so okay. yeah. rather than featuring a vocalist on that song i'm featuring the guitarist you know yeah yeah no, that or makes sense. if we have like a record with a drum solo on it like i want to feature the like the person that's playing the drums on the record as if they're an artist as well you know yeah awesome because i don't know if, it, if it, that, that stuff like really cool too and it's like also it's like I, I'm like a liner note kid, you know what I'm saying? Like I always read through that stuff, so it's just like a cool way to be able to, um, like, like kind of just like be able to like lay the red carpet out to an extent for like the mm -hmm. folks that I, I personally feel like really deserve to be there. Yeah, 
Yeah, are you familiar with um, Avant Dale Bowling Club? Wait, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Uh, are you familiar with Avant Dale Bowling Club? Uh, yes, actually. Yeah, just um, the way you're sort of discussing, like uh, referencing the musicians sort of being a part of the record and stuff reminds me of the approach that he takes with his albums where um, it's like the whole band is a part of a part of it and like not just him. Exactly, um, you know, um, yeah. Um, so that's like something that's like really important to me. Like I've been like, like I said, trying to like make an ecosystem for all the musicians that I know and respect, mm-hmm. like especially the ones that I like, especially the musicians that I know that don't necessarily want to be artists. They just want to be musicians. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Because yeah. like in this day and age, like, you got to have a brand for everything and be like making a reel of you in the studio, in the lab and da 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 And like, that's not necessarily for everybody and not yeah. everybody wants that. And like, they don't, des- like, I don't think that those types of people shouldn't like deserve to have like opportunities to establish like active or passive income for themselves as musicians, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes sense. people lose sight of that type of stuff. Like I think that being, being, being back home definitely made me um like it, it it exposed it it re-exposed me to like the world of what being a musician is like outside of the music industry when you know you're doing like just gigs for a living and things of that nature instead of it being you know like placement work and stuff like that or getting like syncs and licensing so um even in that regard it's like i'm just trying to make sure that i establish like a comfortable middle ground for all the people that i know that play music so that they can you know make a living off that shit Mm-hmm. Awesome. I think that makes a lot of sense. I've, I, I sometimes I, I when I think about like artistry, uh, you know, when uh, like maybe newer people come into it, their questions sometimes fall into, what kind of name should I have? What kind of aesthetic should I use? But not actually getting into what kind of art they're making and why they're making it, and trying to make a a story to sell. Yeah, and, like, by the time that you really, really learn that you, like, love this shit too much to sell it, now you're in a position where you're trapped having to sell it, you know? Yeah. Some people just want to sing. Some people just, like, some people just want to play the drums, you know what I'm saying? And it's, like, those people should be able to do that stuff as well, too, but be able to, like, share their passions in comfortable ways without having to sell a brand, you know? Yeah, that's what I um found. I started like selling music, but um I found that once money got involved, I and like like it just and that pressure to sort of build myself as an artist as opposed to just doing it for fun, like it started to become tiresome. Absolutely, uh, yeah, that but, shit can be super complicated, yeah. especially like if like especially if like you aren't educated enough to like know how to show up consistently for the other people that you're creating with. You know what I'm saying? And not I think that sometimes people like lose sight of the fact that like, yeah, not everybody knows all of this stuff and not everyone's like necessarily supposed to. Like the people who are, that's awesome, but like don't take advantage of people just because you know that support them, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally. So, so um, I'm, like, I look at this project as kind of like the like it's like mixing the concrete to like set the foundation down and like show people yeah. like what that can look and feel like on a on a you know on a high level creatively. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. So when you when you work with like another artist on a song, do you try and like reach out and like make the song together, or do you? prefer to just get things from them and work independently and then combine it at the end um it depends on the song that i'm making there are some songs where it's like i would love to just like get in the studio and write with folks and like come up with the concept together but then there are some times where it's like i'm coming up with an idea by myself and i'm like oh wow this needs this individual's presence you know what i'm saying and um even in that regard, it's like uh, my intuition will tell me like, hey, this person's supposed to be on this record, but it won't tell me how they're supposed to be on it. It's like, mm-hmm. I just want to see how, like, I, I just want to give you the opportunity to show up on the record. If you don't, that's totally fine. But if you do, like, you have the freedom to do what you want. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that a lot of people get, like, excitement bias and, like, project their expectations upon people with the music that they want to hear and see. Especially like, artists do that as well, too. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I just try to make sure like, like 
I heard a, uh, I remember, I can't remember who, I think actually no, Max said this quote. Mac Miller said this quote. Um, he said it like you, you don't tell Thundercat how to play bass. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And it's just like that shit resonated with me when I heard that, and I was just like, oh okay, bet cool. This mm-hmm. this makes hella sense, and like. All I need to do is just make sure that the moment happens. But beyond that, I'm like, I, I've I've done my job. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you, yeah. The, oh, I was gonna say like Sorry, with, with 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 that in mind, like you know, you when, when you're collaborating on art, you gotta you know keep in mind that that this is gonna be someone else's art piece too. They're putting their soul into this too. How often yep. do you see? You know, you have kind of an idea. You don't have an exact. Thing, a direction for them to go they do their thing how often do you see that actually steer it away from what you originally were planning um not very often honestly and even if it did i feel like it would like obviously depending on the circumstances and the situation i feel like in a lot of ways my intuition would tell me that like hey maybe that's the direction that we're supposed to go in you know um I, I, sorry about the noise in the background and stuff like no that. We're just putting all the equipment away. Um, but yeah, I th- I think that um, when it comes to that type of stuff, it's like I don't necessarily feel like there's um, like circumstances or situation where it's like it doesn't necessarily like match what I was going for, especially if like what I was going for was just someone to show up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's like. If you like, as as long as I think that the only time that I would have like a conflict with somebody showing up is if they didn't, if I felt like they didn't, weren't showing up as their authentic selves, and then yeah. in that moment I would want to like try to push them to do that, you know. Uh, I, I think that's that got to be I the bare that. minimum when it comes oh, to, to so hard people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I think that people sometimes lose sight of that because they are so specific on what they want, but mm-hmm. like my my biggest specificity is like. I'm just handpicking the people that I want to be present in the experience and in the moment. Mm-hmm. And then yeah. whatever those folks do, that to, that to me is more than good enough because I picked them. Like you're like yeah. from picking them, I, I, I know that like I like I've, I usually like I'm studying and seeing your work and I'm like, oh, OK, it, it will totally make sense for you to exist within this space. So mm-hmm. that's why ideally for people that I'm, you know, like, selecting and stuff like that, it's just, it, it feels, like, organic or natural for them to show up. And, um, yeah. that's what, that, you know, that's how it's been with, like, a lot of the musicians on the record, specifically, and, um, like, the producers and stuff like that, so it's been a, yeah. a really cool experience. Yeah, awesome. No, collaboration's, like, it's honestly the backbone of music for me, like, without, without it, I don't think I'd be making music. I think it's the backbone oh, of creativity. I feel you a thousand percent. Yeah. Like I totally, mm. totally feel you. You know, without without collaboration, I don't know if, like, you know what I'm saying. Like, the, like collaboration is like what empowered the people that taught me to teach me in the first mm. place. Like, I'm gonna yeah. share what I know with you. Totally. Yeah. So, um, how many different versions of each track do you sort of go through before you get to the final final version? <laughs> my god um <laughs> for the first track on the record i think that there's like at least like 10 versions right now yeah um, and that's like 10 versions that have been like exported out as like specific renditions that's not like the different versions that i go through that just exist inside of like ableton or mm-hmm. inside of like fl studio or whatever dog that we're using to work on the track you know Mm-hmm. Like I would say that we might like export ten different like renders or passes or drafts of a song before we even yeah. like send it to mixing and mastering. Mm-hmm. But then like there's at least like twenty to thirty different iterations of each pass where it's like yeah. a song thing that gets changed. Maybe maybe I re-record a, a a line or two, or maybe I have to re-record an entire verse or. Oh, mm-hmm. shit, a car flipped over. Yeah. Wow. Y'all good? Sheesh, okay. Yeah. Did that just wow. happen in front of Price you guys? Right. Or did you just say that? We just, like, drove over a hill and saw that this car was flipped over. That's crazy. Uh, Sheesh. I hope they're okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, man. 
So, like, when you do, like, end up choosing a, a version, do you find yourself, like, ever, like, kind of compromising, kind of being like, uh, well, I feel this one more than this other one, and not enough to, like, actually feel satisfied, or do you do you only do it, in, or do you only keep pushing it until you find the exact right product at the end? I think that I've learned to push to a healthy compromise. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's possible to do that as well, where it's like, you can see what's you can see what's like an envision what's there, but you can also be like realistic about the parameters of even like your own expectations and things of that nature. And um I think that like there are some times where it's like, oh yeah, if we spent more time on this specific thing, yeah, that could that could work for this other specific thing that we're doing. You know what I'm saying? Like maybe that might make this sound more like maybe that makes that make sound like the production more like a little bit lush or something like that or maybe adding more layers to something, but then that might take away from, like, the essence of the track as well, too, or, like, that thing that, like, we, like, that raw, that raw feeling that we captured in the demo might get taken away in the pursuit of perfection. Yeah. You know what oh, I'm saying? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. I've, like, allowed and established, like, uh, you know, like, in, internally and mentally, it's just like, oh, okay, cool, like, I can safely, like, I can I can safely wipe my hands and say that this it's I've done. done everything that I can on this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That's um. Honestly, I think one of the hardest things I've learned is being able to finish something and just be like, like this is this is it. This is good enough. Um, rather than just no, tweaking, I, like I definitely feel every, you on that. Yeah, I think just that tweaking, like, like for, for me, little. a lot of stuff has been like. Uh, how do I describe it? It has been, um, like, it's like, I feel like I've finished a lot of the things that I can do to my abilities right now for what I want to do without Mm -hmm. having to, like, overextend myself, um, creatively for the projects. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, do, like, is that supposed to be my voice or is that supposed to be an instrument? You know what I'm saying? Or is that supposed to be, like, is that supposed to be where another verse goes? Or is that supposed to be where we, like, flesh this production out a little bit more to bring movement to the instrumentation? And then whenever that next verse comes in afterwards, you don't feel like you have to, like, you have this, like, space that you need to fill in, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, Just bringing, like, like the the more movement and motion that comes to the records and stuff like that, I think is... um, yeah. Yeah, you know, like it, it, it add, that that type of stuff adds more depth to it for sure. But like I said, it's also like just using discernment and being able to say like, oh, okay, cool, like this, like this is the masterpiece that it needs to be because it's been made, not necessarily hmm. because of anything else that's gonna get put on top of it. Yeah. How much does like input from like other people actually really come into play? When with your own personal project, when it comes huh. to making those uh, decisions, to you know what, this is a healthy point to move on, and all that. Um. Hmm. I feel like it's um. Usually, that's like usually those are questions that I like. I'll like I'll ask people like what do they think needs to be added once I feel like I've added everything that I can? Mm. Yeah. So even in that regard, if it's like, if you're like, that's like a trusted group of people that I do it with. It's like, yo, do you think that this needs anything? And they're like, nah, it's like, okay, cool. Then like, I can start to think about putting a bow in this. Yeah. I can figure out what putting a bow in that looks like and feels like, you know? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I um, I think sometimes like it's good as well to take your work to other people because they might tell you what you don't want to hear. Um, and it can be like eye opening to get that kind of feedback as well. I I think it's pretty hard to find someone who's willing to kind of grill you with what with what you're working on in or you know, you know constructively. And my dad. <laughs> <laughs> valid. That's valid as fuck. I'm I'm super fortunate to kind of have a circle of homies that are pretty like tough critics. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like 
I can like there's some things where it's like it's different it's a difference when someone feels like there's nothing that needs to be added to a record versus when a record doesn't do something for somebody. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm. How do you respond like, to it's like, that? Um, by continuing to make more records, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> At the end of the day, I think that it's like, you know, creativity isn't a finite resource necessarily. Mm. So it's just a matter of, um, putting your energy into the right things, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And sometimes you're not always putting your energy into the right thing and that's a-okay. Yeah. No, definitely. That's, I, I think, like it, one of the hardest things I think is like finding well, at least I found yeah, personally, I think it's like, like the time yeah. that you that people put in the shit. They're just like, yeah. "Oh, I put so much time into this; it must be good." And it's like it's not necessarily always the case, even for myself, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, no, my biggest, uh, my biggest song, um, the it took me seven minutes to make the beat for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's like kind of weird to think about that, where it's like songs that like I put, put way much more time into, like aren't weren't that like popular. Um, yeah, and I mean, like, even like that, like, popularity is, like, relative. It's, like, what the song does for yeah. you, you know what I'm saying? There's things yeah. that I've put a lot of time into that didn't do much for me, and then there's things that I put a little bit of time into that did a fuck ton for me. Mm. Yeah. Just, like, no, from definitely. my soul and my spirit, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. Um, Rick, did you want to ask this next question? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, you, you keep talking about, like, you know, trying to diversify that sound, and Everybody obviously hears it through these snippets that you've been dropping here and there for the past couple of years. Uh, so how many how many different styles of instrumentation can we expect uh, on this on this album? That the video uh, preview you dropped previously just the other day was honestly pretty surprising. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I mean, I think that what people can at least for like the first project, what people can expect is um like. I want things to sound um I want things to sound like they have like depth to them. Like I want it to have musical depth to it to where I feel like, you know, like in the music that or like the the songs that I was like contributing to in BH people are always like, "Oh, you had to like listen to this verse like two or three times." And it's like I want people to listen to the music two or three times before mm. they can like catch all the details. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And um, that's, like, kind of the, like, it, it, there's just, like, a lot of granular notes in the production and in the instrumentation and in the sound design and stuff like that. And it's, like, mm-hmm. there are things that might sound like samples that aren't samples and, like, vice versa. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's just, like, being able to kind of, like, blend, like, like, it's, like, blending the space between, like, a lot of the sounds that I'm a big fan of, you know, so there's, uh, like, I, I'll, I'll say that it's like a lot of like the music I like to listen to is the stuff that I've been making and what it sounds like lately for me, at least is, is like, Oh, okay, cool. This is like, this is, if you're speaking, you cut up. sorry. No, we lost no. Um, the, the the rains, the storm. Hold on, can you guys can you guys hear me? There I'm you sorry, are. Yeah. Oh, there no, you are. if you were, yeah, we yeah, you cut out during the second part of whatever you were saying. No, no worries, it's all good. Um, yeah, it's just like uh, what are we talking about what, again? We were that, talking what the about... sounds you you've been listening to and trying to put that into your. Music. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like you know, like I'm trying to make music that would just exist in the world that like I already occupy, oh, instead of making like a new world for my music. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I feel so that. I so feel like, hard. Uh, yeah, I feel like my sound is uh, it's like pretty grounded in reality right now, and then mm. if it ever like steps outside of that it does it like really intentionally you know Mm -hmm. so like there's some stuff that might sound like a little bit shroomy but it's not gonna sound shroomy in like the traditional way that everybody else's shit sounds shroomy it's gonna be like a much more intricate detailed like sensation and it might not be one that everybody even catches 
because of how intricate and detailed it is. Mm-hmm. It really sounds yeah. like you're on like a conductor tip where you're really you're, you're you're building it like Lego blocks instead of just trying to, you know, like when a producer maybe like makes a a, a drum loop or something like that. It sounds it, it sounds like almost the same as if you were writing a verse, just the music. Yeah, I mean, like even in that regard, right? So, like to kind of talk about the production process for the record. Um, so me and Bleak, we've been making music now for about like consistently together for about like two and a half years at this point. Awesome. And when like basically like as we got more and more chemistry as creatives together and we like like he like got more trust with me creatively and stuff like that it kind of dawned on me that like he's like the ideal drum programmer and sound selector for like all the soundscapes that i want to create right now so (laughs) all that i need to do is just give him like the adequate playing ground and playing field to be able to do the dopest patterns and like rhythmic sequences and melodic sequences that he possibly can Mm. and then even in that regard it's like we'll take that stuff and then bring it to musicians and i'll kind of like take a executive producer composer role and be like hey this like for example like this sample didn't originally sound like this it's like pitched down eight semitones and chopped up six ways to sunday But, like, what if we played it that way? And then what if you added another B section and we treated that like the A section? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if that's a little bit complicated. No, I think think it's really cool to intentionally play with, like, structure, with, you know, submersing. Like, you're already playing with samples. That's already kind of submersing music and intentionally feeding into that. I think the results are going to speak for themselves. And I think Again, that, like, it's also yeah. a natural part of the music that all the musicians that I know and have affinity for and I'm spending time around, like, it's something they naturally do. Um, mm. oh, like, like, kind of to go back even to what we were talking about before with, like, how music culture works and how music works outside of the music industry. Like, most, like, most musicians that are not industry-based, that are making a living are gigging acts and most of those gigs are them doing covers of really popular songs that other people like but they just want a live version of it sung in front of them for their wedding or their sweet 16 or be it you may you know what i'm saying but that's Mm. like that is most blue collar musicians bread and butter you know what i mean yeah yeah so in that regard, like a lot of the best musicians that I know, know how to play so much music, but then on top of knowing how to play it, they can expand upon it, like Mm -hmm. on demand and like improvisationally. And I think that that's so incredible. And like, as a, as a musician, that was something that I wanted to capture, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Some people just like just another language. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, I think that even in that range, it's like there, there's languages on top of languages on top of languages. Yeah, it's culture. like, you, you know, like the way that one person plays guitar that has grown up in like a jazz circle out here is going to be completely different than someone who grew up in like a Latin American Puerto Rican circle mm-hmm. where they're playing like, you know, like merengue and shit like that. And it's like a completely different format of how you're playing your instrument. You know what I'm saying? versus like the jazz crowd or the folk crowd or the alternative crowd and um that's just something that like before i was like in bh i would spend a lot of time like going to shows out here and just like be like just being a music enthusiast at the end of the yeah. day and yeah. um no, it's, yeah it's just, it, it, there's i'm 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 really like privileged to be from a place that has such a rich music culture um yeah. And it's just not necessarily, uh, what's it called? What's the word for it? It's, it's, it's pretty underrated. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not Mm. like, like, uh, like where we were from, what would be considered like a marginalized community. So like in a lot of ways, a lot of that art hasn't been recognized, um, on any sort of platforms outside of the ones that we've made for ourselves that exist here. Mm. And I'm doing the same thing. It's just that my platform is a little bit different than the ones that traditionally have existed around here. Yeah. No, it's really cool. Um, like, like seeing, like just from being a part of, um, 
the block and like jumping on your streams and stuff and seeing the range of cool musicians that are sort of like in Connecticut. Um, it's, it like, blows my mind every single yeah. day. Like I'm always introduced to somebody new. Yeah, because like before joining or anything, the only musician I'd ever heard of from Connecticut was Moby. Um, and aside from that, I didn't know any others. Um, I didn't then, fucking know Moby was from CT. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, no, he is. Um, That's but yeah, crazy. So, yeah, so before that, I only knew Moby, but then I've joined the block and then like found like through your streams and stuff, just like heaps of like really cool. Um, There's a really rich music culture here. Like yeah, MGMT started at Wesleyan. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's like a university that's like right around the corner from where my brother grew up at. Yeah, that's sick. You may, yeah, and the way you talk yeah. about it, like it's so connected that it makes it seem like it's a small place, but I know it ain't. It's, I would say, in consideration to the rest of America, CT's pretty small. Mm. Like you can drive from one side of it to the other in like the span of like two and a half hours. See that's you know that, that, see that, but see like I, I'm talking about from my perspective at the very least, then, because that that's 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 a long ass drive in, inside the town. Oh no, that's not inside the town. It's the whole state. Oh, you're talking about the whole state. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's yeah. the whole state. Within that's the whole state, it's like a two hour drive from one end to the other. We're like smack dab in between New York and Boston and New York and Massachusetts. So it's just like that that tiny guy that's right there, and then Delaware's right, and then Rhode Island's right next to it. Like that's like th- those are us right there. Like so it's it's tiny on the American map, but it's like really dense here. Mm-hmm. And there's like so much to do. And there's so many nooks and crannies, and there's so much nature. And like yeah, so it's um I like I said like I've I've been really privileged to like have like this access to a world outside of Connecticut. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just kind of want to, like, I want to, like, make Connecticut, like, my world again. And in the process of making that my world again, introduce the rest of my world to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. No, I think, um, like, building, like, a local scene, I think is kind of underrated. I think so many people are as musicians, what I've experienced, so many people uh, want to get out of their local scene and not many people will get out and then bring back, come back into it. Facts. I love learning about local scenes, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I think that w- without local scenes, like, like I was saying before, like, the blue-collar, like, music, like, like gigging musician, like, we, we need those scenes, <laughs> you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like, without yeah. without those scenes, like, a lot of people will not be able to make music for a living without yeah. having to do something in the industry. And I don't think that yeah. that should be the only option. Like, so, yeah, I, I, I feel you. Yeah, like it's been awesome because we have uh, a rapper uh, called Wombat um, from Tasmania who's he's gone, like become one of the biggest rappers in the country. But he's recently just started doing, again, like heaps of features for a lot of local artists. Um um, and it's just been really inspiring and watching him make it to like the very top of Australian hip hop and then to come oh, back yeah. to Tas- Tasmania. Um, like literally a guy I went to high school with got a feature from Wombat. Um, yeah, man. It's, it's just awesome to see him like give back like that. Um, the greats build know. bridges and ladders, yeah. dude. For real, for real. Mm. It's part yeah, of yeah. being the part of being the best is building a bridge. Mm. Yeah. You can be really good at what you do, but there's no way you're gonna be the best if you mm-hmm. can't if you can't do that. You know what I'm saying? That like, like even like culturally, you know what I'm saying? Like all the mm-hmm. guys that pass the torch to Kendrick, them passing that torch solidifies them so much more than the people who didn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like like for example, like looking at Eminem dissing all the new rappers versus people from Eminem's era that are working with all like the new rappers and yep. you can see like the difference in people's perception of those artists and yeah absolutely you know yeah. and you know things things age the way that they're supposed to in that regard mm-hmm. well um so the next question i think we had up was um if you could describe uh the new wave of music you're working on in a couple of words what would it be real nigga shit <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah real nigga shit that is what i'm that that is like honestly that i i'm trying to think of like anything else and it's like that's the first thing that comes to my head and it's just like mm. i would just be filtering it if i can't with anything else that's how city. Yeah. awesome 
Rick, do you want to get this yeah, next so <laughs> this next, next question? One, <laughs> so we're we're gonna get get into some kind of specific questions. This next one is: uh, Was a theremin involved in the production at all? And if not, no, <laughs> no. But I wish. I need to, if someone if someone can find me a theremin, or if someone can like ship a theremin over here, I totally will throw that on some records. Hey, everybody, <laughs> listen to the neighborhood radio right now. Tap in. If you're near the <laughs> Connecticut area with the theremin in your possession, <laughs> feel free um, to, to, let's to get hit, it. Let's get it. Let's get it popping. Theremin, a theremin was used on Kids Say Ghosts, wasn't it? On the, the track. Was Kids it actually Ghosts? a theremin or was it like a theremin sound that someone played on Ableton Push? Because that's not a theremin. Well, yeah, I know I know that on the, the title track that there was supposedly a theremin used. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but... Interesting. I uh, have read that online. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So I that's... see. Very interesting 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 yeah. i always i always think stuff like that is fun when folks do that i only believe apex twin when you talk when people talk about <laughs> they made, they made, they made. i mean i mean considering that kanye has literally sampled apex twin i wouldn't put it wouldn't put i wouldn't put it past kanye to sampling apex in, twin and using apex twins gear to get those sounds are a totally different yeah. thing no, I like I wouldn't put it, I'm just saying I wouldn't put it past Kanye to inherit Apex Twins uh desire of putting weird shit on his albums. Oh facts, but, uh, facts, 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 yeah. facts. Like out of all artists, if it was gonna be anyone, I think it would be Kanye. But, <laughs> Real. Yeah. Alright. So uh next question. Speaking of specifics, we have someone ask if you can do a tribute verse for their late dog Mambo. Aww. I can totally like make a song for Mambo. That like if some yeah, absolutely. Hell yeah. Is this a is this a is this for real or is this Maddie? Like, yes, this yes, no, yes, no, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. No. Maddie, she's in no, chat is, right now. Is, Mambo, yeah. her 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 dog passed. Oh, I'm so yeah. sorry. And uh yeah. that that's that's really yeah. sweet. Hell yeah. Nah, yeah, nah. We shout out Mambo, we'll, rest we'll, in peace. Well, a hundred. I would, yeah. Like, dog, I'll, I'll definitely make some. I'll make some. We will we'll make a song on stream for for Mambo. That sounds Mamba. fire. Yeah, Mambo number yeah. one. Yeah, Mambo number one. Not number All five. Right. Number one. Going straight. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so awesome. The next question uh, says, "Hi Dom, what's been your favorite memory so far from working on this project?" Ooh, ooh. My favorite memory so far from working on this project. Um, <laughs> there's so many, there's so many wild things that have happened in my life as I've been working on this. Um, befriending a bird has been like really trippy. Oh, yeah, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> like, he's just like he's just the homie now like for real for real it's crazy like he was just chilling on my head while i was playing drums the other day and i'm just like yo you, you, you like you're fine with this this is crazy blows my mind so like stuff like that has been happening like really random stuff like that is like really fun memories but then i think that like honestly probably my favorite memory has been like the first time hearing that like one of the tracks like completely like composed and mixed together and stuff like that and just hearing like the the labor of love that like was put together and like the, like how it all like kind of like turns into this amalgamation and came to a head and i was like oh shit this is this is really real you know what i'm saying so like the moment where everything felt real to me in that regard of like being like oh okay all these ideas that we had like they're fucking possible that um that was probably like my favorite memory you know, feeling like that, that getting that like feeling through what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Who, who's bird? Whose bird is it? Is it just uh, one of the uh, per musicians you've been working with in the studio? Or? <laughs> so, um, one of the videographers that I've been working with, my homie Kirk, he like pretty much like he adopted a bird, but like the way that he adopted it is like the craziest fucking story ever. He's at the golf course with his friends. He got invited to go play golf with one of his friends. So he's out there playing golf 
and a bird literally like flies onto the course and just like lands on his bag and doesn't leave. There you go. So, and next thing you like know, you my, got a bird. So my first instinct when he was like telling me about this, I'm like, yo, you have to take this thing to the vet and like make sure that it's not like escaped from somewhere or like make sure that it like chip gets red or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Like mm. my like environmentalist brain like jumped out a little bit you know what i'm saying and mm-hmm. i'm just like okay um well yeah let's make sure that this thing is like safe and like that it's not like sick or anything like that because usually you know especially if it's like a wild animal it's like but it didn't look like a wild animal it looked like a mm. very Domesticated. very yes exactly but it's a like a literal baby um it I it must have like escaped from like a pet store before it got tagged or something like that and like literally just landed on this dude's bag. But yeah. they've been absolutely inseparable since then. When he took it to the vet, the bird had no chip on it or anything like that. It's literally just like it it was a, a bird that is imprinted on him and has been his homie ever since then. And every time the bird comes around, we just kick it. That's amazing. There you go. We love, love, we love. Shout out, shout out, Goody. So for real, shout out to Goody. That like <laughs> it, it trips me out. He just really be vibing. <laughs> He's just the homie. All right. So the next question I think we had was uh. So from what we've heard of your project, sounds like it has some like pretty cool like samples and stuff. Um. So uh, someone was wondering uh, where do you pull from when it comes to sample inspiration um so it's been really interesting like i am not the one that is coming up i'm not the one pulling the samples i'm the one that is like putting the people together that have pools of records that are like available for us to utilize Mm -hmm. whether they have like the publishing and the rights and stuff like that taking care of them and stuff like that so that's um the role that like Alex has been playing essentially as like the executive producer for the record, which mm-hmm. is pretty tight. Like um essentially like he has a bunch of like relationships that he's established with like different sample libraries and things of that nature. And um they are trying to like breathe new life into this music. And within breathing new life into it, it's like there's like access to these massive libraries of records that are like the the publishing is like pre-cleared for them and things of that nature so it's like really easy to just get the records to the finish line no one's asking for like 80 percent of the song or anything like disrespectful like that so it's like pretty fun to be able to like just mess with that type of stuff and then Mm -hmm. see what comes of it and then if what and then if we hit like a wall with it essentially where it's like yo we like this four bar loop but we want it to be an eight bar loop that's when it's time to like pass it to musicians and like have them expand upon the idea and then it might turn into something completely brand new yeah so basically the reason why i do that is so that like i pass these samples off to bleak and then bleak just gets to completely go in where however he's that wherever he sees the sound going and then i just you know what i'm saying like like exactly you know what i'm saying like in yeah. that same way we were saying you don't let you don't tell thunder guy how to play bass like I, I definitely don't tell him how to make beats you know what i'm saying so i just i just pass this i just pass records to him essentially and let him go and let him go sick yeah yeah awesome so was has blake would is has is the whole project produced by him um pretty much yeah yeah um, I think that there's like one or two songs that might be produced by Alex as well too, or that are produced by like me and Alex. Mm-hmm. But the majority of the record is produced by Bleak, and then it has like executive production by Alex. So like usually it's like samples mm-hmm. coming from his catalog and library and things of that nature. Or Alex is like assisting mm-hmm. in the sound design for the yeah. compositions that I'm creating for the new like the new like stuff that we're doing with musicians and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So how long have you really been working? Like, obviously, you know, even when you're in... The picture is fucking in the hilarious. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I just saw this picture in the fucking chat. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Ridiculous. John is here if y'all want to say what's up, by the way. 
Hello, hey, John. Yo, what up, everyone? Just uh, to the neighborhood radio. Listen to, yeah. Yes, sir. Neighborhood radio, 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 radio. Let's go. <laughs> as as as, fe- as featured in Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> yeah. Type shit. You heard this? I'll go ahead. Go go sick with that. Yes. Uh, um. So I know you you've been obviously you know in part of the Brockhampton for for decent portion of time, but you know you. You cut out, Rick. Haven't been working on your own like. Uh, solo stuff so how long have you been really working on this project and how long has this project existed as quote-unquote changing of the trees how much how long has that okay. process taken yeah so no funny shit like there was a point in time like being in bh where i had no intention of putting solo music out i was just like mm-hmm. this is enough like this is <laughs> I, I more mean, than enough sense, for me yeah. so you know what i'm like, saying like i'm super gucci on like the idea of like having to do anything as a solo act and um spent so i spent a lot of time trying to figure out how i can like make an impact in like more of the like civil social equity spaces in music mm-hmm. and um a lot of the people that i like sat down and talked with were like you should you should work on your brand more for the sake of the things that you want to do for your community and like mm-hmm. the things that you want to do for the greater good of like how music should work for people that love art. And I'm just like, okay, word. I feel that, but I don't necessarily feel, um, like I felt compelled to say more outside of music than in music, you know? (laughs) And um, with reconnecting with Bleak, honestly, I think that that kind of um, ignited something inside of me where it was like, wow, like I haven't... um, I haven't made music that sounds like this in like a decade. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's just like, oh, okay, this is like, this is what like a different form of rapping feels like. This is what rapping feels like when the goal isn't necessarily um, for like playing a specific role in. Mm. uh like in in the like the the sphere of public conscious or social conscious you know what i'm saying um or even like playing a specific role in a group you know what i'm saying it's like i'm just making music to make music instead of making music with the purpose of it fitting in between these two verses or something like that you know Mm. and i think that that kind of um like that was what inspired me to start (laughs) you know what i'm Mm -hmm. saying um, yeah. Once we started, the first project that we started working on, I felt like was what was going to be like my debut album. And I was like, oh, fuck, this is really like this is this is like music I'm really proud of. And I feel like it tells my story and like, you know, shares like deep things about who I am and shit. And I'm like, yeah. but if I put this out right now, the like. I don't think that it'll really get received as like my story. I think that it'll just get received yeah. as like the first collections of songs that I put out after being in this group. So I was like, mm. let me try to like work on like the tone setter first and then like yeah. turn this into what's next. Mm. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Makes and, sense. Um, yeah. In the process of doing that, that's when we started working on like the stuff that we made before the changing mm. of the trees. And then after we started working on that, we were like, oh, this is really dope as well, too. What the fuck? We need to, like, do something that sets a little bit more of a tone because this is, like, coming out swinging. Like, this is, this mm. is really fucking crazy. So yeah. we went back and started making more stuff again. And, like, the purpose mm. of the stuff that we were making there was it was just, like, yo, let's, like, kind of take everything that we've been putting together so far and, like, instead of it being like balls to the wall or like a magnum opus let's just actually make something that sets the tone yeah and i think that Uh, we had to get all that other shit out of our system first yeah totally and and like now we're at a place where things like really feel and sound that way to me where it's like the first song on this record sounds like the first song that people should hear in my discography like yeah. as a project post bh you know yeah makes sense yeah no that um yeah no i um 
no, that may, makes a ton of sense. I think I think that sort of leads into. I had a personal question um, that I think this sort of uh, sort of leads into, um, yes, which was. Um, so uh, I'm like in a lot of BH communities, like on Reddit and Facebook and stuff. And I think uh, one of the things I've noticed is that there's been a lot of spotlight on like who's going to drop first, like who's going to be the first person to do something post BH, like drop a project. And I was just wondering whether there was a lot of pressure for you being that person. No, I don't think that no. I even, I don't even know if I will be, you know what I'm saying? Mm. <laughs> Yeah, like I, I literally have no idea. Like someone mm. could drop a project fucking tomorrow that I have no idea about, and yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, mm -hmm. and everyone has like their own provocative and volition that they can move with, and it's like yeah, they're free to be able to. Do I feel yeah. any pressure about anything in relation to BH at all? Honestly, no. Yeah. Um, but the reason that I don't is because I'm doing something that's for me. Mm, and it's yeah, like no, so for me sense. that if it's not for people who were fans of BH, I'm totally cool with that. Mm. Yeah. No, for sure. And um then my 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 other second question that I had personally was um so thesis side B, that's like when I was like in high school, me and my friend Noah, we used to always listen to it when we uh, we worked at the cinema and we were allowed to play whatever music we wanted while we cleaned. And we used to always listen to Hounds of Love by Kate Bush and Thesis Side B. Um, and so I was just wondering, um, I guess. It's so crazy to me. <laughs> so crazy to me. Yo, um... Me and John are just staring at each other like, like, yo, bro, crazy, crazy times. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, so I guess. Uh, First of all, I just want to say, yeah, that that record was something that, yeah, me and my friend Noah used to always listen to, and it was like one of my favorite albums from my high school sort of period. Um, but the uh, so, so where I was going with that was, um, I was just wondering how much uh, you've taken from Thesis Side B, um, and that kind of—I know you mentioned once that had a bit of like UK, um, uh, like bass influence, which is um, mm -hmm. makes sense why I loved it so much because at the same time I was into Burial and James Blake a lot. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering. Yeah, yeah, whether, record, yeah. yeah, I was just wondering whether or not you were taking any of that into your new, um, new work. Absolutely, I think that the biggest, no funny shit. The biggest thing that I've taken away from making records like that in that period of time in my life, especially after being in BH, is that it's okay to not say everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that I was trying to say so much on those records at that point in time in life. And like, yeah, some of that stuff I may have achieved, which is tight. But like, yeah. now I feel like my messaging is like so much more direct because instead of talking about like 20 different things, I'm talking about one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that like, that's the, the biggest takeaway from making that music that I can go into with the music that I make now is just like, it's like that that meme with IQ. It's like, oh, say less. It's like literally that, though. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, mm -hmm. say a little bit less, make it mean more, and like, let the music speak. You know what I'm saying? Um, sometimes the music doesn't even have to be your words. It can be literally the music. And you can contextualize those sounds with the words that you say so that when it breathes out again, people are thinking about the shit that they just heard. And you're like, oh, mm -hmm. that's what that means. Or, you know what I'm saying? Whatever it is. So I've just been, um, you know, thinking about like, like definitely, I think that um, there's still like a little bit of like non-conformative and like anti-traditionalist um spirit to any record that I'm gonna make, and that stuff yeah. I feel like I established the most within making a project like Thesis Side B. Um, yeah, I was just like on my creative anarchist wave at that point mm -hmm. in time, but yeah. who isn't when they're like. 23 you know what i'm saying yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um yeah but yeah so like i would say that like if there's anything that i took away from those records it's like yeah i don't one i don't have to do everything by myself you know and two i don't have to say everything mm. like the immediate moment that someone gets a chance to hear me yeah yeah no for sure and um my final question was just what your favorite new Jabez song is. <laughs> Ooh, wow. That's such a good question, dude. That's wow. Wow. 
Um, okay, so mist line. Yep. That, It'll be that's, mist line. That, mist line, um, yep. And then second would be feather. Oh, classic. I love, Third I would be lovesick O2. Uh-huh. Yep. And then the fourth would be um I think the song's called Ah, uh, it's off this it's off of a Samurai Shampoo compilation, all with the blue cover. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. I think it was called Longitude, maybe it was with him and either it was either him and Suchi or him and Fat John. But um there's like it's it was the one on the blue cover and like I used to like go to sleep to that record like every fucking day. Yeah. Yeah. No, the Samurai Shampoo soundtrack. Bola. I um yeah, New Jabez like I remember when I got into him, it was like entering a whole new world of like like production and mm-hmm. Rest in peace. He um yeah. I got a video of myself. Um, I, I went to a museum. Um, and they had some sort of like science thing, and they had a, a instrument that you could play by hitting a thong with it. Um, and I got a video of myself playing Reflection Eternal. Um, That's fire. A... <laughs> Which was funny. Um, but yeah. Anyway, yeah, cool. No, there's some pretty pretty solid picks. Um, so yeah. thank you. Appreciate anyway, that. that's it. That's um that's it for my my personal questions, Rick. Word. So like. Okay. In those ten years between since now and the thesis side B, you know how how much like did did did, did it ever come into mind consciously as you were making this what your last statement as a solo artist was and like have oh, you, yeah. did you consciously you know translate any of the messages from back then and evolve them or you know how how much did that really just come into mind when you were actually making this? I feel like the person that I am now is talking to the person back then that was making that record with the songs that I'm making today. Mm. Like, it's like, it, 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 would, it would be like me telling that guy, like, yo, slow the fuck down. Like, don't trip. You got it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, Like, trust yourself, trust your abilities. Like, and like, w- almost being like, this is what it sounds like when you trust your abilities. And like, when you're confident in yourself, this is, this is how you can sound. And you can be saying shit like this instead of the things that you were saying at that point in time in your life. So, so uh, like, was that was uh, that on purpose to like unnecessarily pass yourself, or do you was that kind of a message you kind of just intended for a younger audience I, in general? No funny shit. That's kind of something that I just realized right now. Mm. Um, but like, you know, when I think about the, the lyrics and the lyrical content and like, in a lot of ways, it's like everything that's being said in this project, it's like, I'm living these raps in real time. It's not like, you know, like a gross exaggeration outside of like the traditional figures of speech or anything like that. But in the most literal sense, there's a lot of things in here where it's like, these are things that, um, it's like, like. I like to almost like call it like manifestation music where it's just like, you know, this is things that I would say to myself in the mirror to make sure that I feel like confident to get shit done. Or it's like if some shit went south or some shit went left, it's like I can look in the mirror and say these things to myself and still feel and stay true to my my essence and my spirit. You know what I'm saying? And I think that um that was something that I was trying to do, like. 10 years ago when I was making songs like, well, I was making records like Thesis, but I think the way that I was doing it was like, I still had something to prove back then. I had to, I feel like I had to prove to my creative community, to other musicians, to bloggers, whoever the fuck, that like, I was not just a rapper, but like a creative ass person. And now I don't feel compelled to prove that to anybody. Um, I just want to do cool shit. So this is what doing cool shit looks like to me now. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like proving anything to anybody. It doesn't look like anything but me being myself and expressing myself in real time in life. That's the right type of growth that you want. 
Uh, you would think so, right? <laughs> like we all, we all aim for growth. You know what I'm saying? That's the that's the the big picture goal at the end of the day. You know, I don't ever want to be in like a fixed or stagnant mindset. You know, but I just want to be in a place where I, at the very least, like creatively and like expressively, I can be honest with myself. You know what I'm saying? Awesome. So my next question was, uh, you know, speaking of, you know, a lot of change, a lot of growth, it seems like a lot of, that's obviously the core theme and idea that you've been kind of running with lately. You, you recently moved from LA back to Connecticut. And Mm -hmm. I know that like that shift vice either way is super huge. How deep in this project were you at that point? when you did move and how much did being closer to your friends, family, that, that core community that means so much to you, how much did that actually impact how, how the project's actually turning out now? Hmm. That's a really good question. So I officially well, moved back here in mid May. So I actually haven't been back that long yet. That's um, true. But I think that, um, like, even though I just moved here mid-May, I've been, like, building my, like, the the creative campus that we've had out here for, like, the past maybe, like, I don't know, 12 to 16 months. Mm. So we, like, we set the found like, you know what I'm saying? Like, we set the foundation a little bit, broke the ground at least before we set the foundation. Um, And I think that it's just given me more opportunities to, like, show up for like, my loved ones, like, my friends and family and shit like that, I feel like, um, I get to be, like, a better uncle for, like, my nieces and nephews and shit, and, like, a better, like, cousin and, like, a, just a better homie as a whole, just being able to be present and show up for folks. Hmm. I really, um, you know, you, you hear a lot about, you know, the work that artists do on being an artist, but, this this whole thing was really like for me to work on myself. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that um, there was a point in time where when I wasn't working on myself as much, I didn't. I I was like, just not liking where I was at in life, and I was like, I don't like being in LA. It wasn't that I didn't like Los Angeles. I just didn't. That wasn't the place for me. But, like, now I'm in a place where it's, like, I I totally accept that. You know what I'm saying? And if anything, I want to, like, find places there that can be for me where I can show up for a community and shit like that. Instead of just being like, oh, this place ain't for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um. But, like, yeah, this, this was really, like, a, a big move just for me to try to be like a better person and like a, a better son and like a better brother and shit like that. <laughs> like more than being a better artist, honestly. Um, I'm, I'm going to keep it a super stack with you. I'm not that concerned about being a better artist. I think that I'm more than good enough where I'm at creatively. It's just a matter of like making sure that I have an outlet and I stay expressive and like Use my creativity. Use my creativity more as a vessel for like other creative people that I know to get their shit off, than focusing on getting my shit off. That's a pretty unique standpoint or viewpoint of it, especially if someone in your position. Like mm-hmm. I'll always keep growing and continuing to be creative and challenging myself and learning new ways to create, but that's not necessarily what I'm working on. That's just something that I naturally do. Mm-hmm. So. Why do I have like it, it, it's almost like in a, it's almost escapism like it's a, it's a form of escapism to like be like oh I gotta work on my brand or I gotta work on this or I gotta work on that if I haven't put that self work in and I'm dead ass still working on that shit in real time every day. Hmm. Yeah, hell yeah. Well, so that's. Well, Go on. That's the like yeah. So that's sorry, my fault. That's the big thing mm. for moving back here. It's like yeah, no, working no, on cool, myself cool. and shit like yeah. that. And I think that yeah, the, I think that even just the way that I talk about myself and the way that I talk about like places I do like, people I do like, places I don't like, I don't dislike anybody. But mm. you get know what I'm saying? Like in that in that whole spirit, it's just like that all 
shows the the growth for me, at least. Mm-hmm. That's great. I know yeah. that a, a lot of that stuff that you know it, that's from your you know uh, where you're raised and everything like stuff like that's always gonna be really meaningful mm-hmm. for a lot of people. And you know the way you describe it, you know you come from a side of a part of human history where like people in general just that side of the u.s and there's a communities are just super tight-knit and you know you always talk about how much you've seen Mm. and i can only imagine being away from it for so long to la of all places Mm. and apologies if i missed this part of the answer because i had to go get a drink and some food but um would you would, would you say that it would have been a completely different record if you were to stay in la uh, and rather than move back to Connecticut, I don't think I would have done it. You don't think you would have done it? Okay. Nope. There we go. I I would have done something different. Like I think that my my intentions and visions were like in such a specific place, and like I've been able to utilize making this record as a extra tool to build community where I'm from. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, and and that was like a really important purpose of even doing that for like making the music for me was being able to say, Hey, here's how I'm using my music as a tool to Mm. be able to like assist us more, bring more resources into the community. It's like, yeah, I don't necessarily like, I'm not pressed to drop a record unless I'm incentivized to, and the way that I'm incentivized, you know what I'm saying? It's like those types (laughs) of things. It's like, I'll just give y'all music for free. Like, not yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's like the 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 way that I I look at things philosophically when it comes to that type of shit. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel like um, <clears throat> like time and place. I mean, and obvious. I think this is kind of an obvious thing to say, but like I feel like time and place just has such a strong influence over the kinds of like art that we create. Um, and it's, Word, it's yeah, like, I feel that. and it's like, like really like, uh, interesting, I guess how much like, like the space that we inhabit can, um, can impact, uh, like the, the, the stuff that we put out and like, even if our, even if our mindset is sort of similar, just even being in like a completely different space can mm-hmm. just completely change like the work that 1000% uh, space is the place, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Mm. Sunra says that shit for a reason. A lot of people think that he's talking about outer space. He's talking about your fucking personal space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. For sure. It's um it's like something I've noticed a lot with like a lot of uh like Norwegian black metal, for example. Like I feel like a lot of that is a direct result of not even the mindset that the artists had at the time, but more so reflecting the landscape of the country that they um uh, like live live in and yeah it's just like really really cool to see that like in people's music I think, uh, no that's fact. i think that even like with like you see that even like with like swedish pop and shit like that it's mm-hmm. like the, yeah the way that the music is written it's like um there's like a sense of self to the and like a sense of like belonging of self to mm. the the melodies and the harmonies and like the songwriting i think that's why people yeah. like always resonate with that shit so much Mm -hmm. i think it that really makes sense when you look at it through the lens of music history you know you look at a lot of artistic or uh, musical movements from you know 1600s 1700s and stuff like that and how it directly you know was in reference to some you know big global event or whatever i think the fact that we can actually already observe that in modern music i think is very very interesting Yo, mm-hmm. you make you make a great point, dude. So a lot of people don't know this, but I went to I went to school for music journalism, and when I was at UConn for that, I took um one of the music history classes that I took. Like, we went through all of the eras of like contemporary, post contemporary, post modern music, all that type of shit. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. something that's very specific and unique to like music after the believe it's after the romantic era specifically um and like going into like the commercialization of music as well to more as a product that's where genres get introduced 
But before that, music is described literally by the era of time in which it was correl- like corresponding to. Mm. Mm. Like, yeah. all Baroque music is part of the Baroque era. Right, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, it's really, really interesting how, like, all that stuff gets hyper catalog and categorized and shit like that. So mm-hmm. you're definitely making points when, when you're talking about how just like the, the, the big connective tissue between all of it is really just the perception of self. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, for sure. It's um and no, it's really like I like I suppose like looking back at uh music history and it's like really almost like awesome to see how much great music was literally like how many great scenes have come out of just like-minded people experiencing similar things at the same time exactly like looking at like like bristol for example like shithole city in the united kingdom spawned massive attack porter's head um and like 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 and all those awesome like artists that were on a similar wavelength it can't be that much of a shithole right you know what i'm saying Mm. yeah yeah but and it's just like really cool like that whatever whatever was going on in bristol at that time just influenced random people to just come together and create the same kind of art and the same kind of music and enough mm-hmm. to the point where bristol has become known for a whole genre of music um and yeah and it's just really cool to look at examples of that throughout history um for sure okay yeah and, i got a uh, question for yeah. you guys actually too yeah so did you guys have anything else that you guys needed to like go through with neighborhood radio today? Cause you know that I'll sit here and talk with y'all on Q and a for like four hours about this shit. But like, was there like any music or anything like that, that we needed to like go through or anything like that? Cause uh, I was supposed to just like jump and shit. Like I that. only had one more question. We were going to jump into the, I love my plug oh. section. If you wanted to, oh, shit. you wanted to join us for it. Yeah, I was, I'm definitely down. I'll just be muted. Cause I'm going to be eating some oh, spaghetti. Yeah, I'm down. down. That's, cool. That's cool. Yeah. My last question was just, uh, you know, you know, you, you talk about like how you're creative, you know, music, you know, the actual musician part of things like actually playing an instrument, you know, the programming of it. Maybe you're a writer, you rap, but you're also, you, you know, lately you've also been showing off a lot of your graphic art chops, a lot of your skills in that regard. And I don't believe we've really uh, seen a cover. So I, I was just wondering, you know, I'm not, you know, asking for a preview of the cover, but like, did, did have you had any hands on the on the making of that or how, how, how what's that looking like is it a photograph piece of art i'm just interested on that on that since that hasn't really shown off no worries um it's a photograph i'll tell you that part um i won't share it with y'all right now because i do want to like have a reveal for it and shit like that oh, yeah. but mm-hmm. it's in a location that y'all are familiar with based off of the stuff that has been in the rollout like it's like literally around the corner from where some of the pictures and videos have been taken we just haven't shown that part of the area yet Okay. okay you know what i'm saying um but uh like how do i describe it so i've been learning over this is something i've been learning over the last like three years right i'm learning that a lot of great design does not happen on paper but it happens like through conversation and communication and also through community mm. so ultimately like spending time sitting down with the people that I'm sitting down with to come up with the idea for what we shot for the cover art is how I contributed to the design. Whether or not I pressed the shutter and like, like I framed the shot with the person before they pressed the shutter. You know what I'm saying? Like those types of things where it's like a lot of granular detail. But before we even framed that shot, we all sat down in a room and talked together about the type of feeling that we wanted that shot to evoke. Yep. So, you know, that's like, like in those levels and those like, that, like we're, I've been like being super, super intentional with the art and not just being like, oh, let's just do some random shit. Yeah, you know cool what I'm saying? Picture, you know, like everything is pretty intentional in that regard. And it's like, if y'all were to like send this shit to like rainbow, he'd be like, oh, wow, this is all literally like in the same location. It just looks like it's not. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I think I think cover art's a very underrated aspect of uh, the well, giving I mean, someone a, a collection of music. I think right, yeah. well, because the thing I've always thought with cover art is like it's the first engagement that anyone has with your music. So it's like like how many times have you listened to an album because you think the cover art's awesome versus how many times have you 
get the album because it's got some emotion. Oh, it's it's going to be forever yep. associated with that music. And exactly. You're absolutely that's why. Right. I, like that's why it's always been like cover art. I like there's low key been times when I've spent just as much time on a cover art as I have on a song. <laughs> um, that, that makes mad because, sense. I feel you a thousand percent. Because it's like yeah, like like people that like if if I've got like a cover art that's like got a few colors on it, people are gonna be thinking of, about those colors when they're listening to the music, and I want the music to sound like those colors. If that if that makes any sense. Oh, of course. No, that makes uh, so much sense, dude. Yeah. So anyway, that um, nah. so I'm not really keen to see the cover art. Um, I, because yeah, again, it's one of my personal personal favorite parts of music. Um, so yeah, um, like so, all right. To so give you guys kind of like a a preview of an idea of what the cover is, it's pretty much like the same framed shot in different parts of the year. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. I, that's okay, hard. I already that's got hard. I, that's okay. Yeah. I like that concept. I like the idea of that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, yet yeah, lately I've been seeing a lot of videos where like it's a uh, like 30, 50 different pictures taken and there's something in it that ha that's the exact same shape between across mm -hmm. all those pictures and seeing that edited together. So I've uh, seen mm. a lot of overlaying imagery. That, that that's always really cool. Yeah. They yeah, are, they it's like it, it, it's like it's a really interesting story to be able to be told with that type of stuff and it's like i've been thinking about even like okay how is this going to be presented in like its physical format and it's like okay when you look at it like in the record store and you're walking by what are you going to see and then when you look at it and then you open it up what else are you going to see you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. and just like okay how do we make sure that this experience is just like oh this is this is crazy you know what i'm saying like this is like it's visceral and detailed and just as intricate. Mm -hmm. I want it to feel just as intricate as the production does. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. No, 100%. That's um, definitely one of the, like, I, I think, um, least, not, not least, but I think it's, I think it's for me, a, a great sign of a record is great cover art. Cause I think it shows that they're putting in more thought, like on more, on more than just one level, with like the pr presentation of the package and everything. Um, yeah, so. that's like like with Kids See Ghosts. Like I knew that was going to be a classic the moment I saw that cover up. <laughs> um, so and that's how I, I I hope that that same feeling gets evoked. Like when people see this shit, they're like, "Whoa, this is going to be." I I I'm not sure what I'm getting into. You know what I'm saying? Like I, it's fun. Yeah. Like I'm like looking at it and I'm like, is it a cover for a folk project? Is yeah. it a cover for a rap project? Is it a cover for like the last thing that I expect it to be is a cover for a rap project? Mm -hmm. Hell yeah! Especially in uh, a rap circle, that's a good that's a good uh a good sign. Yeah. Totally. I, yeah, I think everyone. I think I speak for everyone in here. When I say that, where I'm very, very excited to see it. Oh yeah. All awesome, right. Awesome, awesome. All right. Well, I think okay. that. Well, I, I think that is is that the that was the last question, right? That, I think that. Oh. Uh, no. Uh, I no. Yeah. Sorry. I just I I just thought of this one. I just thought of this one, but it was just one. Um, I was sort of wondering. Um, so like Tom York. Um, a lot of his solo music. Probably like thirty to forty percent of it is, or maybe not that high, but I know I know a lot of it is scrapped Radiohead material. Tom um, York is he, that nigga, yo. That, I fuck yeah. with Tom so heavy. Yeah. So a lot of his work is scrapped Radiohead work, and I was just wondering if um you had any solo music that was something that didn't work within BH that you've sort of taken and reworked into your own. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think that was part of the point of doing BH. It was like, you know, there's there's shots that are not going to land on this court that might land on mine. It's like, mm. what am I supposed to do? Not take that? Come on. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. It's ridiculous. But yeah. um, more than, more than anything, I think that um, it's just like the sheer volume of what we created. And like, there are certain things where it's like, oh, okay, I know that line isn't necessarily for this record, but I, mm. I, I'm in the space where it's like, I'm working this muscle, working this muscle, working this muscle. It's like, oh yeah, mm. 
let's let's put that verse in the tuck. You know what I'm saying? Or yeah. let's not put that verse in the tuck. Let's put it out there. But if it's not what's needed for this song, throw it back mm. in the tuck. Awesome. Cool. Nah, um, that makes a lot of sense. I yeah, think it's it... all about just being resourceful yeah. with your art and creativity and shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Definitely. I think yeah. the worst thing someone can do is throw away a piece of their art. No concept gets left behind. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I found a lot. Like, a lot of my shit is from... Like, my album that I released, like, a few months ago has stuff from, like, 2017. Um, I feel you on that. Yeah. So it's like... like I feel like something can always... That's how you know it's good. Because you sat on it since 2017 and you were still down to put it out. Mm, yeah. No, for sure. Still the, te- anyway. still the test of time for you. Of course, it's going to be for other people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. It's all about just being confident in yourself enough to believe that. Yeah. Some, some, no, last, sure. some wise words from Don McLennan himself. <laughs> Appreciate on, y'all. On yeah. the neighborhood radio. Q and A questions right. from the from the audience from members of the server. Thank you guys for submitting. It means a lot. Shout out to the block. Shout out to the block. Shout out to the block. But yeah, yeah I still don't have my sound. But I would otherwise I would. Yeah. <laughs> 